Good morning again and welcome to this Friday edition of the Daily Bible Study. And I uh, want to welcome you and, uh, and uh, so glad that you're joining us again today. And if you've been with us, you know that yesterday we began answering the question and dealing with some of the claims of uh, those who are cessationists, those who claim that spiritual gifts are not for today. And so we're looking at that question and answering Uh, Are the spiritual gifts for today? And uh, yesterday we examined a passage from 1 Corinthians 13 that the cessationists like to use as a proof text. But as we saw yesterday, uh, that very text actually proves that they're wrong in their view and that spiritual gifts will not cease until the perfect age to come. And so today we want to consider some of the other suppositions that they present as an argument against the view of continuation of the spiritual gifts. They claim that history proves that the gifts ceased with the apostolic age. The cessationists claim that history proves that the gifts ceased with the end of the apostolic age. Now, this statement may be considered to be both somewhat true and false. However, the fact is that truthfully, it has been affirmed throughout all history that the gifts have not ceased. But let's consider for a moment the element of truth regarding their claim. There's an element of truth in it, insomuch that there was a great diminishing of the gifts, not only after the apostolic age, but even toward its end. But this was not because the Lord withdrew them. It was rather, and to quote John Wesley, Because the love of many, almost of all Christians so-called, waxed cold. This was the real cause why the extraordinary gifts of the Holy Ghost were no longer to be found in the Christian church. End quote. You know, thank God for the gift that he gave the church and the man named John Wesley, who at a time when Christianity was mostly dead liturgy, uh, he sought God by faith until his heart he said, was strangely warmed. He knew he'd been born again. And God used him to give to the church a category of theology that would pave the way for the Pentecostal renewal that grew out of the biblical second blessing gospel that Wesley uncovered and gave to the body of Christ. And all throughout church history during times of revival, uh, the gifts of the Spirit have appeared in some form or another. This fact is a matter of recorded history. And the increase of power and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the church is traced in correlation, uh, in parallel to the stages and eras in which God restored his order of salvation to the church. It began in the 1500s with the renewal of justification by faith. And so after this, people were being genuinely born again. And then in the 1700s came the renewal of the doctrine of sanctification through John Wesley. And with this came a greater dimension and experience of the power of the Holy Spirit. Wesley recorded the events on the evening of January 1st, 1739. It reads this way. Mr. Hall, Kinchin, Ingham, Whitfield, Hutchins, and my brother Charles were present in our love feast in Fetter Lane with about 60 of our brethren. About three in the morning, as we were continuing instant in prayer, the power of God came mightily upon us, insomuch that we cried out for exceeding joy, and many fell to the ground. As soon as we recovered a little from that all and amazement at the presence of His Majesty, we broke out with one voice. We praise Thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. Amen. The gifts and manifestations of the Spirit appeared and were recorded among the Quakers, the Methodists, the Holiness, Presbyterians, and others uh, all throughout church history. And there are others I'll mention a little later. Uh, We find some of the first modern-day accounts of speaking with unknown tongues Uh, That is, since the Reformation. Uh, We find some of those accounts 
uh, in the British revivals of the 1800s. An outbreak of the manifestation of tongues took place in 1831 in the Presbyterian Church of Regent Square in London. Uh, the pastor's name was Edward Irving, and although he never spoke with tongues himself, many of his members did, including one member by the name of Henry Drummond, who was a member of the British Parliament. Irving went so far as to say that tongues was the standing sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Tongues were a manifestation that took place in the ministry of D.L. Moody, uh, Dwight L. Moody. For example, in 1875 in London's Victoria Hall, uh, Moody preached in a YMCA meeting. And after the service, it was recorded that Moody left the group, quote, on fire with young men reportedly speaking with tongues and prophesying. Tongues were also manifest in the Welsh Revival of 1904. It was reported in the Yorkshire Post that young men and women who knew nothing of old Welsh uh, would in their ecstasy in the spirit speak in the tongue. On one occasion, a visiting Dutch pastor stood and gave an entire message to the people in English, a language that he did not know. There were healings that took place during these times of revival and spiritual power. But it all came to a climax in the years between 1900 and 1906 when God brought to the church the renewal of the third blessing of Pentecost. In the 1500s, it was justification renewed. In the 1700s, sanctification was renewed. And in the 1900s, we, found, we came to the renewal of the Pentecostal baptism with the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a word of caution that should be given and that should be heeded, and it's this. Men need to know that it is a serious thing to accuse God of withdrawing these gifts when the real fact is that the church, for the most part, lost them through its own lukewarm faith and its sin. It's a serious thing to attribute to God what was the result of man's sinfulness. And there are some today who teach that any such manifestations are the work of the devil. They claim that tongues, uh, that it's the babbling of demons, and that signs are the deception of Satan. And those of us in the Pentecostal camp, we admit that there are counterfeits. There is the false. Uh, but doesn't the Bible tell us that that would be so? And that we would have to judge the fruit, the doctrine, of all manifestations. You see, there can be no counterfeit unless there is a true and genuine article. And we need to seriously consider the words of Jesus. He said in Mark chapter 3, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. You see, Jesus had been casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the religious leaders said that he was doing it by the power of Beelzebub. The power of the devil, Beelzebub, was known as the prince of demons. And so thus we see that the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit that it is against his person and the works that he does, ascribing them to be the work of the devil or some diabolical force. Jesus said that this is an eternal sin. The statement by the cessationists that the gifts ceased with the apostolic age and that that is an historical fact is false. Because the gifts have never entirely ceased. Uh, church fathers such as Irenaeus, uh, Tertullian, Chrysostom, Augustine, 
They all referred to the gifts as being still existent in the Christian church of their own times. Even during the dark Middle Ages, they appeared among the persecuted Waldenses and the uh, Albigenses and then among the Jansenists and down through, as we have previously stated, the Methodist, Presbyterians, Holiness, and so on. Peter stood and declared on the great day of Pentecost and said these words. It says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So those of you listening, if you've been called by God to salvation, if you have repented and been saved, and if you have not, you can be. If you'll come to Christ and be born again, you can be. And that's the call of God. To as many as the Lord our God shall call. If you've been called by God to salvation, if you've repented and been saved, if you've been baptized, then you are to seek and ask for the subsequent gifts of the Spirit, the further works of grace. If you have received Jesus for the remission of sins, then you are to seek and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, for the promise is to you, and all his gifts are good and perfect. For every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Friend, if you're saved today, if you've been born again, the question is, have you been sanctified holy? Have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking with unknown tongues? If you have not, the promise is to you. It's to all that the Lord our God shall call. So seek him today. And ask him for his blessed gifts. And until next time, God bless you today, my friends.